Good morning. Uh, I don't think I'm supposed to speak uh, because I don't know. Anyways, I decided to be obedient to Pastor Chung. You know, okay, abruptly I just made what I could do. Uh, it won't take a long time. No. So maybe I will spend 35. Yeah, less than 30 minutes for presentation. And if there are, you know, the we will also have questions or you know, comments. Yeah, that will be that will be okay. Mm. So what I was told was uh, we we're gonna talk about how we can better serve the Philippines. Uh, regarding doing missions as you know the foreign missionaries of course our backgrounds could be different today uh, and also areas are also various but anyways so I decided to share about uh, my own evaluation upon uh, my ministry experiences in the Philippines because I didn't live in any other life of mine so uh, mine is actually just full of errors and many mistakes so I don't I don't try to boast or I don't try to stress on like uh, achievement or only in a positive ways of ministry experiences. But I also love to share about my errors uh, and also mistakes, you know, so that we can at least have like insights among us, uh, so that later on we can see. Um, so it could be you no know, little things about uh, how we can better serve the Philippines and even beyond. Uh, if I'm asked to introduce myself a little bit, I'm a Korean missionary in the Philippines. I came over to the country uh, year 1999. It was right after my honeymoon. Okay, so I just came to a place where I was never invited. Okay, and I did my uh, study, uh, theological education, in this country because you know I was formerly an engineering person, so I never did in a, uh, theological education before. So I did my bachelor degree from Philippine Baptist Theological Seminary, and also I did my MA and MD program from uh, South Pacific Theological Seminary, and I'm still studying. I'm doing my PhD program from. Oxford Center for Mission Studies, where uh, Dr. Lim was once an assistant academic dean many years ago. Right. Now, this is a kind of uh, cooperative work with uh, uh, Middlesex University, London now. Maybe your time here was different. Yeah, what was it? Wales. Wales, yeah. yes. Wales. You know, Wales University was working together. Not anymore. And formerly, I was the director of Yongsan Mission Center. This is also located in Baguio City. Uh, we have two hectare lot and good facilities, having many uh, different ways of ministries. But uh, I regret, in in many parts, you know, for those ministry experiences. And I will share later on. And I, I am also former president of Maranatha Bible College. Uh, this college has been many years. Uh, founded in 1978. Uh, still running? And still, still running, running yes. Uh, the, it was founded by Reverend Winfield Kelly from McCormick Found Foundation. And after he retired, you know, the leadership was passed to a Filipino leadership, Filipino Alumni Association. Uh, year 2010, I took over the leadership as the president. And last year, I finished my term. I came down to Antipolo now. Okay. And now I'm director of Maratha Mission, which is focusing on uh, training missionaries from Asia for Asia. Uh, and, and also director of Atea uh, Missionary Training Committee. Atea is uh, an association of theological education in Asia. Uh, I, I believe many of you are familiar, uh, like uh, Dr. Kim, Kim Woo-hwan, Kim Woo -hwan, uh, Kim. from Chongshin University. Uh, actually, it was founded by uh, Pastor Kim Hwa-yeong, 
in the beginning. Uh, many are GMS uh, missionaries, while I'm not. <laughs> but anyways, I'm uh, serving together uh, as a, a director of uh, ATEA Missionary Training Committee there. And also I'm superintendent of KAZMP. Uh, KAZMP is standing for Korean Assembly of God Missions in the Philippines. I'm from Korean AG, uh, the Pentecostal. So if there is my speciality background, it is Pentecostal. But my theology is more like uh, Reformation or you know, Evangelicals. Yeah, that is my uh, background. So I brought uh, three areas because uh, this is, you know, about what I have experienced in the past. So number one will be about a partnership with the PGCAG. PGCAG is uh, Philippine General Council of Assemblies of God. Uh, and also uh, Yongsan Mission Center experience because I was there as the director. And also the third one uh, will be about the Maratha Bible College Ministry. So where uh, I have served the theological education at the same time missionary training experiences. Okay, so let us go on. Now number one, partnership with the PGC AG. Uh, though I'm not exclusively for the denomination Assemblies of God in the Philippines, but simply because I am from uh, Assemblies of God in Korea, so I was encouraged and also suggested to work together with the denomination. But anyways, don't be mistaken, uh, from the beginning my ministry has been interdenominational. Even Maranatha Bible College the school is interdenominational. Uh, but anyways, while pursuing my ministry in Baguio City, I also served partnershiping with the PGC AG. In terms of these two areas, number one, church planting, and number two, church building projects, which I now doubt. So I will, I will share a little bit more than that. Uh, then, uh, let me talk about church planting first. Uh, in the partnership area with the PGC AG. Uh, I, I, I have uh, planted local churches uh, in some places. Uh, not many, uh, but anyways I did. So this is one of the churches, Max Faith Fellowship Church. Uh, I did that was a cooperative work with uh, some other Korean missionaries. Uh, in industry proper, we established one local church. So without having a local pastor, as a foreign missionaries, we planted a church. Well, the church uh, later, it, it was started uh, from a home Bible study uh, ministry. But later on, you know, the Bible study became bigger than uh, with the, uh, the community's you know, appreciation, then the barangay donated a certain size of lot on which we built a building, church building. Then later on, the church became stronger and now independent. It is self-supporting. So it will be a one of good examples of local church you know, founded by and also ministered by foreign missionaries in Baguio City. And this is another church, Emmanuel Church, also in Baguio City. Now, because we already had a you know, good facility in a mission center compound, inviting neighbors around so we started you know, one church and this was a little different from the beginning because i appreciated you know the local pastor and local leadership so i was just there as an assistant and supporter from behind while local leadership was i mean doing pro uh, proactive work and ministry so the church is also strong and rapidly growing now and it is in you know, one of influential churches in the region Then, uh, I, I would like to ask you know, myself about these you know, questions. Why church planting as a foreign missionary? Maybe it is because uh, we, especially Korean missionaries, we have a, a myth saying uh, church planting is uh, automatically expansion of the kingdom of God. And Korean church is too much church oriented. When church, church oriented, the, the, the expression itself looks okay yeah, but you know the, in many times our Christianity is confined in the concept 
saying that uh, the church is everything about in you know, a Christian world. That is why whether we are called for whatever you know the ministry, usually Korean missionaries from day first, you know, when we you know, came over, I'm come over to this country, we usually start you know, planting or building a church. So which I did too. But you know, looking at the situation today, I now doubt whether we really have to do the same, I mean, continually, I mean, looking at the situation. Uh, the denomination I have served, the PGCAG, they uh, have such a thing like 8PA, 8-point eight agenda in their denomination. So out of 8 agenda, number 4 is about plant another church. It means that the denomination is already strong enough. My goodness. I mean, they can do whatever they like to do including planting churches and even building church buildings, which I really love to see. So the, the, the content of the agenda is create the church planting teams and train church planners in the Bible schools, mobilize churches for the saturation challenge, so-called 2020 churches by 2020. Wow. Um, I think Assembly of God in this country is one of, not one of, uh, the, maybe, maybe the, is it? Yeah, the, the, the maybe, uh, what is that? The rapid growth? Uh, oh, yes, yes. In terms of the number, maybe. Oh, yes, yes. So, uh, approximately, they have a little more than 4,000 churches as of year 2016. And now they are talking about the harvest of 5,000. It means that they are targeting number 5,000. And also they are targeting that by 2020, they would have 2020 more churches in different areas. So looking at this situation, as you know, Dr. Lim said, the Philippines is the only Christian country in Asia. And even the Protestant churches are rapidly growing and also strong enough then they are able to do whatever you know, they like to do, then question, I mean, do foreign missionaries still have to do what local churches can do? So uh, I, I stopped uh, church planting work you know, the many years ago because of this reason. So this is max space church building, you know, the barangay donated kind of useless uh, portion of a lot. <laughs> Uh, nobody, nobody could you know, build whatever. Then you know the upon this you know, useless you know the I mean place we yes we you know the established the, the high the columns and you know, the, the portions and only to be just you know the built up building. Uh, not only max space church building, but oh this is church building project which is number two. Oh, anyways, let me go ahead. You know the. In addition to uh, church planting min ministry, I also did the church building projects in different places. Uh, I have served uh, 17 different building projects you know, here and there in different provinces so far. So these are in the pictures of those churches. They are uh, in Benguet Mountain Province, Ilocoso Sur, Ilocoso Norte, and Pampanga, some are small, some are big. Uh, yeah, this is you know, what I did for uh, church building projects here and there. Uh, so, uh, ma mainly and majorly supported by Korean churches. But this is one of churches, uh, which is huge, as you see. Good for 1,500 persons at a time. Another church in Mountain Province. So talking about this ministry in partnership with the PGCAG, another question then, why building projects? So why I was anxious about building so many buildings here and there? Maybe it is also because, you know, the, including myself, Christian missionaries, we are uh, anxious about buildings and facilities. Because talking of church, automatically, we are reminded of a building. Thinking that maybe bringing people from outside you know, into the, the building, then that is already 
an expansion of kingdom. I don't know. Uh, so, uh, uh, of course, you know, the, there were some minimum way of principles while I was doing this ministry too. Because I didn't just, you know, the give money. I also, you know, they had my own principles. Like no land, no building. Uh, to be supported, the local church has to have at least their own lot. And also, do you, are you familiar to Dr. Won Seung Ma's work? Yeah, with his wife, Julie? No, no, no. Won Seung Ma was also, you know, the serving uh, many churches in Mountain Province. Yeah, thank you. And also, he, he did, you know, the many building projects here and there through, you know, the similar way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, the, Dr. Won Seung Ma, he was one of my you know, teachers, you know, from APTS. Uh, the after him, and I also uh, uh, took the took the leadership upon uh, this work, and uh, our principles were like no land, no building thing. So the local church had had uh, have to do their own uh, contribution. They have to make you know their lot prepared, and also they have to make a you know, pledge. Maybe they will shoulder at least you know, half of you know the, the building project expenses, so that we can say we are just serving or helping, then they would say, oh, we built our own building, you know, by maybe assistance of Korean churches, whatever. So th this was one of the principles. Another was a cooperation with the uh, PDC agent of evaluation. Because there were so many nominee churches. Because many churches, they, they have a congregation, but they don't have buildings yet. Then they would request, right? But we, we cannot just accept you know, whatever request at the same time. So it, it is a long queue already on the list. Then we will, I will ask PGCAG leaders to evaluate thoroughly based on you know, the, their uh, like questionnaires. So how big is you know, the congregation and how committed they are for a church building project and how much they prepared already and how much they you know, make a pledge to make a you know, contribution, whatever. And also, you know, we are uh, thoroughly reading the history of the church. So based upon those, you know, the local evaluation that I have served and also supported the building projects in here and there. But again, again, you know, looking at the situation today, such a thing like 2020 by 2020 and Harvest 5000, I don't find any reason, you know, why I have to continue I mean, doing this kind of ministry because now PSAG is strong enough. And to, of course, you know, needs are everywhere all the time. Yeah. Isn't it true? I mean, even Korean churches. While we are talking about uh, many mega churches in Korea, the majority churches are uh, suffering, and also they are dying. Uh, many scholars they were uh, studying, you know, why Korean churches are rapidly growing. But in the past, now we are, I mean, studying an opposite way. Why Korean churches, I mean, dying rapidly, something like that. So needs are everywhere, even in the Philippines. Uh, but uh, though there are you know, many needs, uh, but you know, looking at the situation and you know the condition, uh, I, I I think we cannot pursue anymore. And another uh, area is about Yongsan Mission Center, uh, where I was there as you know the director. So at Yongsan Mission Center. I served two uh, important ministries. One was the leadership development, uh, development program, uh, usually for local pastors in provinces, including Benguet and Mountain Province and beyond. Because uh, what I saw was uh, many local pastors, they lack like, a proper way of training and education. And even if uh, the denomination has uh, regional schools and district Bible colleges, but number one, they are you know, still far from their own places. Number two, they cannot afford going there. So I, from time to time, I provided a list development program for local pastors. Another ministry was the PKD ministry, which was also in line with uh, serving local pastors. PKD means pastors, kids, discipleship. I found that many pastors from Mountain Province and other rural areas, uh, once they were good, I mean, at, you know, working hard, but as their children grow, 
then no school to send. Even if there is school to send, but they don't you know, have money to support. So because of you know, their children's education, many pastors are leaving their own places I mean, coming to I mean, urban areas like Bagyu city, then they cannot pursue their ministry anymore. So in a way to help and serve their ministries, uh, at my mission center, I invited their children. Uh, most of them were college students because Baguio City is, you know, the so-called the college city. Uh, we, we used to have more than 11 or 12 uh, colleges in the city. So I invited, you know, the pastor's kids so that their parents don't have to worry about their children's education. So there were like uh, scholarship grants and also we provided the facilities to stay and they, we also provided, you know, the spiritual discipleship. Uh, so it was really good environment to I mean pursue their educational opportunity. This is you know the uh, picture from a leadership development program from Mountain Province. And again, you know, a question to myself: Why LDP? I started this because of lack of training opportunities for local pastors there. But situation is becoming. I mean, different, right? You know, things are changing all the time. So now, PGCAC has four regional Bible schools, and 13 district Bible schools and training centers. And they start, you know, the, um, establishing some more training uh, centers, even in rural areas. So, and another thing is, PGCAC organized very fine way of training programs for their own local pastors now not only uh, ministry training, but also even mission training too. So looking at the situation, uh, I, I, I thought maybe I don't have to I mean, continue so that I can focus on some other more meaningful and more necessary ways of ministries for uh, the denomination and the country. Okay, so this comes from my experience. This is you know, from a PKD ministry pictures. Yeah, they are, uh, uh, during daytime, they go to their schools, uh, coming back from their schools, uh, staying at the center. Uh, they are you know, studying, they are, I mean, playing, and they are also having spiritual uh, discipleship. And why PKD? Uh, the intention was to help ministers to focus on their own uh, local ministries uh, not to worry about their children's education, and also to provide uh, PKD, PKDs uh, educational opportunities like in the Philippines, like in like in Baguio City. The situation today it is becoming uh, different too. So the uh, the after these two areas of ministries, you know, later then I moved to another step, which is Maratha Bible College. So I decided to serve maybe theological education, which uh, local churches uh, can do, but you know they cannot do well yet. Okay. Um, so the school provides Bible college education, uh, giving degrees, BTH and MA in ministry, two degrees. And then also another, you know, work we did at the school is MTS, Missionary Training School, uh, for short term, mid term, and even long term missionary training. The story is like this: the the school itself has been many years. It was good school, but when I took over the leadership, the school was about to close because the founder left, and after his retirement, thinking that. Filipino Alumni Association leadership can take care of the school because they had a facility, they had a good number of student body. So while receiving you know, tuition and expenses from students, they could operate the school, which was wrong. Because to run a school, I mean, it costs lots of money and resources all the time. And Alumni Association leaders, though they were faithful, because they are, many of them are from the school. but. Uh, whenever they were fi you know, the facing I mean, difficulties, they started selling whatever. Mm -hmm. 
you know what I mean. Then you know later on, you know the, the school, I mean the window, then they have to move I mean, place to place, worrying about I mean next place to go. So that time, year 2010, I was ready and I was about to open my own school and my facility because we had a good facility already. And I received an email from the states. I was you know traveling there. And Maratha Bible College and leadership, they were having the last meeting among leaders. Pastor Kim, you know, we are about to close the door. But, you know, now we are thinking of you. Maybe you could, I mean, survive the school. Because we heard that you are about to, you know, open your own school. Why don't you accept the school? Because this is, you know, more meaningful to revive it. It was very hard for me to persuade. Korean party, because Korean churches were happy to say, like, oh, we started this school, or we are owning this school, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So my, uh, uh, the, the, the sending and supporting church, actually the church was not happy with my idea in the beginning. But I kept in the first saying, no, 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 we, we don't have to add another number, while we already have, uh, I mean, good schools in, in the city. We have a PBTS, we have ABTS, they are, I mean, more than 50 or 60 years, I mean, good, fine schools. So why we don't, we, we, uh, do we have to add another school here? So later, you know, they agreed, okay, do whatever, but you will be responsible for whatever. But I realized later, I regret it. What I received from, I mean, previous school was almost nothing. Just a few, you know, the pairs of tables and chairs, and just six students who were, I mean, having no place to go. That that was all. But I, uh, I cherished, you know, the, I mean, the the value of the school because school has been many years, mm -hmm. and they have, you know, the good big number of alumni, which are together. Yeah, so. I declared this school is not anymore a school for a pro, uh, training local pastors because the previous school was for training local pastors for the Philippines. But I said this school is now for training missionaries from Asia for Asia because I believe the Philippine churches, uh, even in, including in some other countries you know, in Asia, is a time you know, for you guys to do missions. Of course, you know, in the beginning, I was persecuted. <laughs> Nobody would like to understand what I was talking about. But I you know, kept you know, talking and saying the same thing again and again. But these are you know, pictures from the school. Uh, yeah, we, we had a good number of fine teachers and staff members and students, students from 16 different countries. You know, the good library and the good facility and these are my staff members previously. And this is cafeteria. And this is one of the classrooms. Uh, I, I, I always emphasize that classes should be creative enough. And because teachers are believing that learners are learning while they are teaching. I don't believe so. Right? That, uh, one matters is uh, whether learners are really learning and what they are learning, that is more important. Okay, so, so this is, you know, the, the story about Maratha Bible College. And the school is now having more than 500 alumni in the Philippines and beyond. And it is having Atesaya accreditation, international, international, and also missional school. Uh, students from 16 different countries. These 16 different countries are mostly countries where they have been receiving missions. Like poorer countries. Like Cambodia, Myanmar, Vietnam, Thailand, and also Indonesia, Nepal, India, China, those places. So I am kind of training people who are from like poorer and weaker backgrounds, but they're going to participate in doing global missions in different ways, of course. So another work you know, happening at the school is the missionary training program, which is MT, 
No, no, sorry. It is it should be Mission Training School MTS. So these pictures are taken. Uh, though we 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 also did you know longer term uh, mission training programs, but while because that happened at the school, the the main focus was you know tentatively on short term missionary training programs. So every year, good number of students like 15 to 20, sometimes more than 20. Uh, we have sent those short term missionaries from the school to. Uh, nine to ten different countries and for various uh, mission opportunities. Uh, the, the ministries were like children ministry, English ministry, uh, refugee camp ministry, uh, Bible uh, distribution, uh, ch church planting, all you know the different ministries in different corners of Asia and beyond. So, so far, uh, since 2010, we have had now uh, a little more than 150 short-term missionaries from the program. This is from Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh. This is uh, Boi Pet, Cambodia. This is Boi Pet, Cambo Batambang, Cambodia. Uh, Boi Pet. This is uh, uh, Marado, Indonesia. Yeah, this is uh, a picture, you know, where they are praying before leaving for their, you know, the mission fields. Uh, Jakarta. Oh, this picture, uh, these two fine people are from Laos. Uh, I have visited their own church in Sabaraket, Laos every year, and I all the time encouraged to be a part of global missions as one of the poorest country. And after a while, the church decided to send their own missionaries. Maybe they will start as a missionary, mission, uh, missionary training first. So they decided to send, but they didn't have money. So they expected a scholarship. Pastor Kim, so will you give in a scholarship? We are willing to send our people. I said, no. Number one, I don't have money. Number two, my principle is not to give, especially to those I mean, you know, from poorer backgrounds. So they were in trouble. So the, after a while, the, the church decided to sell whatever they could sell. I know the situation of the church, very poor uh, church. They don't have many things to sell, I know, but they sold. And they made, you know, the, the small seed money and they didn't have an you know, international airport to send to the Philippines. The nearest international airport was Suwanapumi from Bangkok, Thailand. Hiring a 35-seater big old bus, having more than 50 people inside, because uh, three, I mean, in, in addition to these two, there's another. So three persons from three families. So they left from I mean, their place to Suwanapumi International Airport. And from there, with a their, I mean, they send their people. So, what is your expectation? They came from that kind of story, that from day first in the Philippines. They they were not lazy, lazy. I mean, and they were all the time in you know, working hard, uh, praying, like you know, crying out, and they were really, you know, I mean, a good uh, trainees, uh, very faithful. Uh, students. Uh, these are refugee people from Myanmar. Actually, they are Kain people, but from Thailand soil because they are refugees. But after training, they uh, went back to their places as mission planters. They say they will encourage their own people so that Myanmar church will be a mission doing church. Uh, Lisa, uh, she is now for a longer term. Uh, th uh, this is her fourth year in Batambang, Cambodia. So one of my students, alumni of uh, MBC, and she is uh, uh, having a children ministry in, in, a, in a village near to Batambang, Cambodia. So out of this short-term missionary training, we produced a little more than 150 trainees. And also, there are some longer-term missionaries. 
Uh, I would say 11 missionaries, real missionaries, because they are in a cross-cultural setting. But then where are others? Uh, I call others as mission planters because they went back to their own places. Why? Because their countries have been receiving missions, never did in, I mean, uh, mission work before. So they were supposed to go back to their places to mobilize uh, mission works. Uh, so they identify themselves as mission planters in Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, Nepal, Vietnam, and other corners of Asia. So let me conclude my time. It is 12. Yes. Uh, again, I, you know, uh, it was a kind of mess. I just, you know, to share the whatever you know, I experienced in the past. But anyways, uh, if there are insights, you know, how can he uh, better serve? Uh, in my case, especially in, in the mission uh, training area, uh, I would love to uh, share about these, you know, the uh, things. These are maybe we, we still need you know, some more time to talk about it because it is, you know, sometimes hard to comprehend just out of reading, you know, the sentences here. But serving Asians, including Filipino Church. Uh, to serve global missions now. I think this will be one of areas where uh, foreign missionaries can do a contribution. Why? Because we are, now, we are now talking about mission from everywhere to everywhere. Before, just like a vector arrow, there were kind of directions, tendency of directions. Mission has its own directions in general, like from the West to maybe Far East, from Far East to like Southeast. And, and there were kind of directions, but now no more direction. Because mission is in happening from everywhere to everywhere. As some of you mentioned a while ago, Filipino missionaries are doing I mean, mission works in Korea now. Laos people are now desiring to go to Thailand. And also uh, we are talking about uh, sending Myanmar people to Bangladesh. So mission is happening from everywhere to everywhere. Why not Asians? Because we were confined with the concept saying that the mission is possible only with the resources and power, which is power dominated. But now we are talking about mission maybe without money or necessarily without money, right? So new paradigm or paradigm shift is necessary at the time. And missional church, I, I hate this expression, missional church, which is nonsense. Of course, and I really appreciate the, the meaning behind it. Every church should be missional, definitely. But look at the word, the church itself. The church is already sent to the world, and we are all sent to you know, where we are already. Then church is already missional by the identification of church. So missional church is redundant. Isn't it true? Right? If, if any church is not missional yet, it is not a church yet, I believe. So Asian church is the same, including Filipino church here. So I, I, you know, I, I, I'm sick and tired of now building so many buildings here and there. But if, if possible, I love to encourage my friends in the Philippines here to encourage them to be aware of their own identity as a church which should be missional and which is already able to do you know, in different ways of global missions. And another, another thing is we also are to help with avoiding repeti repetition of a power dominant mission and mission imperialism and crescent mentality, pragm um, pragmatism influence, all these things. As a Korean, I am byproduct of all these, honestly speaking. Yes, uh, I, 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 I say that you know, including much of Korean missionaries have been working so hard. I really appreciate you know, such a faithful works, and nobody can defeat Korean missionaries in terms of hard working in the world. We, we don't sleep because we are anxious to achieve a lot, but. Maybe this is based on, unfortunately, you know, the misunderstanding about God's kingdom in a way. Because we were confined with the 
power domain mission. Mission is possible with the money and resources. So the, so far, mission has been from the richer, the poorer, the stronger, the weaker. But look at first, second, and third century Christian world. Who were missionaries? I don't believe they were richer and the stronger. Because the Christian world, ha we have been like marginalized. We were all the time minority. We were persecuted, right? But the real power comes not only from what we have, but from the, the real power of the core of gospel all the time. So I think once we are away from this uh, unfortunate, you know, the, the heritage, maybe we can do better missions in Asia. So Christendom is not Christian in many ways. Christendom is kind of influence and the territory of Christian influence in the world. Uh, thinking that once we are expanding our territory and influence as a Christian uh, church in the world and we are winning the world so that we are expanding the God's kingdom, I don't know which is I don't know. Uh, in, in, in our human history, in church history, Christendom oftentimes was not Christian in many ways. And too much church centeredness uh, based on our dichotomy. Uh, because we have dualism all the time inside the church and outside the church. Inside is holy and safe, outside is dangerous and evil. But as long as we are confined with this in a concept, uh, we cannot communicate with the word uh, which we are trying to communicate the gospel with. Right? And we are always focusing on the results because we are byproduct of pragmatism. You know, many things are from the West. So we, I appreciate, you know, the I'm influenced from the West in many ways, but pragmatism influence, uh, this also ruins in our mentality so that we are focusing on results and effectiveness. This is the reason why Christ, uh, Korean church has been focusing on church growth. Now, not many scholars are talking about church growth anymore, right? Uh, a few, I mean, a while ago, we really appreciated the welcome the concept church growth, believing that rapidly growing churches should have principles. That once we analyze the principles, apply those principles to, to the churches, the churches will grow. But this is based on pragmatism mentality, always emphasizing on results and effectiveness all the time. But if, I mean, results is not result is not everything in in uh, Christian mission. Maybe we, we need days to talk about it. Maybe we we will find some time later. <coughs> Lastly, wow, let me breathe for a moment. Uh, I also have to have, I, I love to have emphasis on transformational training in learner-oriented teaching methodology. My topic is about uh, teaching methodology in missionary training uh, for Asian, train, uh, Asian missionaries uh, in, in Oxford. Um, this is my question again. Who were missionaries in the first, second, and third century. Of course, we have a Paul, Philip, and many other deacons, but they were founding, like establishing foundation of missions, but they were not necessarily everybody like who, who did missions, I mean, preached the gospel that time. I, I don't believe so. And who preached the gospel at the time? There, there were no missionaries. There were no I mean, pastors. But who preached the gospel at the time? Isn't it that slave girls, market vendors, merchants, I mean, those who had to, I mean, go whether they liked it or not. They were sent, and they were not like influential people. 
they were neglected, they were persecuted, they were ignored. My goodness, that time, I mean, what country was America at that time? Roman Empire. Empire. Yes, Pax Romana. And but what happened to more than one third of Roman citizens, you know, I mean, out of those uh, 300 years, short time? Who preached the gospel to Roman citizens at the time? Those, I mean, who were weak enough, poor enough, but while they were just living the gospel, not preaching or teaching the gospel, when they were living the gospel, their owners became Christian believers. My goodness. This is definitely not power dominating. So I love to see the same thing in Asia today. Western missionaries time has gone. <laughs> Of course, we appreciate there, I mean, a lot of works. I really appreciate. Maybe Korean missionaries, their time has gone, I don't know. We did, we did I mean, a lot of work. We worked so hard, I know. But now, Asian missionaries who are necessarily weaker, poorer, marginalized, ignored, neglected, maybe it is time for them to talk about global missions. So, uh, out of my, just a little bit of experience in the past, this is my, you know, the conclusion. Well, there are still so many needs, but needs are everywhere in the world. We are not, you know, the following after needs, but we are pursuing what we are called for. So, uh, seeking what we are called for, if it is in the Philippines or in other corners of Asia, Maybe I believe in God wants us to be involved with such things so we can encourage you know, Asian friends so that we can, they can be more powerful and effective missionaries than us but without, I mean, resources all the time. One European church leader, you know, he told me a very shocking story, Pastor Kim. Maybe I love to see that you Korean missionaries are not, you know, they coming to my country anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. He was not that bad. He said, "I really appreciate a lot of words from Korean missionaries. You did a great job in the past, but now my church, European church, has to stand alone. And to be stand alone, maybe we need to, you know, I mean." stand by ourselves without having any support from you guys. And we decide now to send, you know, the at least 100 missionaries from our denomination every year to Middle East. So I asked, hey, you are one of the poorest countries in the world. And if, even if you send in 100, I mean, missionaries in number, what, what will they do? He said, well, maybe we cannot do many things like you. But my mission is we just go to those places and they will just live the gospel. Just like our forefathers in 1st century, 2nd century, and 3rd century. We we'll just live the gospel and we we'll communicate the gospel with the people there and we we'll die there. That's all. Then, Middle East, Islam worried, Buddhist world, Hinduism worried. Looking at the situation, places where we have stronger challenges, our traditional way of mission is not anymore working. Then if we love to make breakthrough, who knows, we have to do, I mean, all the things in upside down. Then we have a bigger expectation and anticipation on Asian uh, missionaries. So that's all. Uh, this is uh, out of my uh, presentation today. Thank you for listening.